Today I wanted to revisit a couple of things that I have put uh, to the side because there was no clear or evident association with people. But before I do that, I just wanted to remind people that if you are doing research and you have exhausted what you're looking at on the current search engines, to not forget to check them out and exhaust all your possibilities on the Wayback Machine as well. I mean, it's a 50-50 chance whether you're going to get anything of historical nature because on the Wayback Machine because you can use the Wayback Machine to actually go in there physically and do a capture of your own website. So you can back up your own website through the Wayback Machine. So if people have done that, captured their own website, or as they have their web crawler that goes along and just captures images of websites all the time. So it's only under those circumstances that you'll actually find something there. And in some circumstances, you will find that the tabs, when you click on them, there will be an archive on the way back for that as well. So you have a lucky find. But in most circumstances, it's generally the front page that they actually keep um, a capture of. They might actually do captures of the other main pages, but it's not always a given. You know, if you can actually bring up something on the way back machine and you try and click on any of the tabs, there was no capture made of those, so there's no record of them for them to bring up. Okay, so that's just a quick reminder to let people know that when you are researching something, to not forget the Wayback Machine, because uh, you can have a lucky find there. As I said, it's, it's kind of like a treasure hunt. Uh, sometimes uh, you find something and some, sometimes you don't. But at least then you're exhausting every possible means that you have. Now, another thing that I've also, and the reason I've got all these browsers open up, is to show you how different the browsers are. Like um, this one here on the far left is the Firefox browser. Now I've found out that if I have a page on there and I save it to print, that it does it differently than if I had it on another browser. Like I went on to Ilion and did the personal name searches on Firefox and they all came up as this long list that was one underneath one another rather than across the page how it appears on their website. And I tried it on another browser, the same thing. But again, I was still not on the right browser that would actually reproduce that image that I'm looking at on the screen into the print document. So ultimately, your browsers all have their own strengths and weaknesses when it comes to um, saving the information, printing the information, and when you right click. Now on this Firefox one here, I right click, and as you can see, I've got very limited options. I go over here to which one's this? This is Chrome. I've got a few more options, but still very limited. Now I'll go over here to um, Microsoft Edge, and as you can see, there is a lot more options. So ultimately, um, I've never used this web capture before, but luckily, I was on Microsoft Edge when I was on a website actually Dun & Bradstreet's website, checking out names there to see what information they had publicly available that might add to the ATSIC records. And I did a print of it, and it, it was terrible. <laughs> Everything printed over the top of each other, and it was unusable. So I thought, all right, I'll save it. Same thing. And I thought, well... This isn't good because I don't want to have to do screenshots and then put them into one image. So I thought, well, I've seen people send a web capture to me before. So I right clicked and there's the web capture. 
Now, what happens is that it'll come up full page or free select. So in what I was doing earlier, I just put full page. So it will actually just come up in this little thing here where that will provide an image of that whole page. And it turns out to be a really long image that you can't even really read until you zoom in on it. You can also take those images, you can cut them down into pages and then convert them into a PDF. I mean, if you, you've got all the little programs, I've got a program that converts images to PDF, it, it can join them, it can split them up, you know. You've got little programs that tweak these things. Getting information as a web capture when you can't use it as a print or as a save is the only option that's available to you. And it really is that easy to right click, web capture, full, and then click save. And it saves it. And it's then you can go and do with that image as you want. But if you can't save the information, if you can't print the information so it's usable, you can use the right click web capture. Now if you go on free select, it is literally that. I want to capture that bit there. I want to copy it, copied, and now I can go and paste it onto a page, which I'll, where is it? <laughs> And there you have it. So doing a full capture of the page and then taking out of that capture what you may or may not want is a far better option than doing all this sloppy backwards and forwards. Now anything previously up until that point that I couldn't save or print into a PDF, uh, I would do a screenshot, copy and paste it into a document or an a bit um, an image thing and um, then just basically cut off round the screen what I didn't want shove it over so that I'm just keeping that pure bit of information but it is actually too easy especially if you're dealing with the bulk of information to do this and then ultimately you can just click on open the folder there I actually rename the beginning of them so that I know what that web capture is for. You can't tell by the thumbnail because they are, you know, capturing one page or two or three pages on one page. It's very small and it's very narrow. You actually have to zoom in to read it. It's still, it's very readable. It's, it doesn't detract from the quality. It's just that it's as one image it's very long and very narrow and when it appears as a thumbnail you can't identify easily so yes I just have that folder open on one side I do a save I go into the beginning of the web capture and just put in what it was that I captured like in this instance I would probably just put um, CG videos in the circumstance of where I was doing Dun & Bradstreet's ones, I just put the company name that I just done the web capture of in there. And then that information gets added to the folder with all the ATSIC information. And uh, you then start to pull your information together. Because there is information available on the Dun & Bradstreet website that is extra to what ATSIC is telling you. But it is also um, something that you have to also verify that information. You can't actually rely on it. And why I say that is because wherever I, whenever I go anywhere to search anything and I'm looking, say, for company records, the first thing I do is actually put in companies that say I know like Wollumbin Horizons is in liquidation. Will they tell me it's in liquidation? Companies that I know have been deregistered, will they tell me they're deregistered? Now the thing being about Dun & Bradstreet, it's kind of like a 50-50. Um, Wollumbin Horizons is liquid as, has got all these things about the liquidation. 
There are other ones that I know were in liquidation. There's no listing that they're even in liquidation. Then there's all the companies that are deregistered, not listed as deregistered, and this was years ago. But then on the other side of it, you've got all the current information. Yes, on Malumban Horizons. Yes, they've got that on certain companies. They know they're deregistered. So what you have to understand about the information that you're looking at with any kind of these providers is that you're only getting the information that someone else has actually paid for. So it's not to say that there wouldn't be information there. It's just that nobody's paid to update that information. And you will also find that in some circumstances on Dun & Bradstreet's website, you will see a little triangle show up near it to indicate that this information needs updating. See, that's what's supposed to prompt you that because that information needs updating, that you're going to pay to update that because you want the current information. Now, they're not putting it on all files that need updating, just some. So this is why I say that you actually need to check the information that you get from public free source information and how accurate it is because also on the same site there are links to websites that if you follow them is I know that certain businesses are not another business and yet because they operate in the same area it looks like whoever has put that website against that company record has just said, well, this is a business close to it, so we'll put that in there just as a reference. It's supposed to be their website, but it isn't. And a lot of those links that, well, I don't know whether it was because I'm only looking up ones that, yeah, the ones that I am, but a lot of those website links do not work. They all lead to that site doesn't exist, oops, you know, any number of things. But most of the ones I was looking at didn't actually have a website to follow up on, which is unusual again. And the ones that I could follow up on, it's like, well, I know that that business and that business are two separate businesses. They're two separate people. They have got nothing to do with each other except their neighbours and they might say hello and be friends. You know, they're not in business together and one's website is not the other business's website. So, yes, you have to be very careful about the information that you're getting and what it actually means. And also, too, that I was looking at the ATSIC extracts. Hang on, I'll bring some of them up. Now, the one I'm just going to use as an example, because I've actually, as I said, I've been revisiting ones that I've put to the side. Because um, this one here with Mark McMurtry, we know this is the Mark McMurtry. He claims to be director slash COO at Australia Pacific Life Sciences. Now, I've done an, an ATSIC extract on that, and... He's not named as past, present, shareholder, director, anything. So his claim to be involved with Australia Pacific Life Sciences, he thinks he's a director. Is this another fabrication, a big noting thing, or does he actually have an association? Now, I've got a few companies that I've been sitting on because there is no uh, clear connection yet. But then through the course of several conversations with a couple of different people, actually, that this name kept coming up, Australia Pacific Life Sciences. And it was in that instance that I thought, well, I was only interested in it to verify whether Mark McMurtry was a director or coup, <laughs> as he claims. And he's not, because that is false and misleading information. And here is the extract to show that that is false and misleading information. Australia Pacific Life Sciences, Proprietary Limited. Here we go down. We've got Natasha, who is 
well, that's the current address of the registered office, but yes, Natasha and Warren McKay in um, Altona Meadows are currently the director and secretary. And the shareholders, actually, I'll bring up something that's easier for you to look at. See, this is why I do my summaries of the extracts to try and put the information in one page and to reduce it down to an ordered type of information that is very easy to see. So ultimately all this five pages is translated over here into this bit of information and I do have the documents lodged down there although that's actually incorrect I've I've put them back the front because I tried to actually do them from the start of the company so you could follow through on a time flow. Everything is back to front so if you want to watch a time flow you've got to start at the bottom and work your way up and to me that's just not a logical way to watch the time flow of the lodgement of documents. I know it's how they come through on a database but it's putting the time flow back to front. You can't look at it and read down and see the time flow. As I said it's back to front. So I made a bit of a muck up but that one didn't really matter because it's not actually um, well I'm not trying to prove anything with it and it is just a basic summary for I've already got uh, PDFs of the document searches to actually list them separately and they give far more details than what I put across here so ultimately I'm just going to remove all those but just keep the number of documents that they currently have because it's too easy to bring up a PDF match it across and this is where I would like to point out why I'm actually getting to this in the ATSIC extracts they will tell you um, the appointment date and the cessation date of directors and secretaries but there is no mention of when shareholders come on board all you know is that there are shareholders that are current and past shareholders and they don't know, they don't date it but the thing they do do is they actually give you the document number in which that change occurred now in this instance there have been four documents lodged since the company was registered so in those four documents one of them would be to change shares change directors to add shares or directors or whatever so even though it's not dated on the search if you go to that document number and see when that document was lodged as in this instance that is actually the application for the registration of the proprietary limited company so there you would know that straight away that it is the beginning even if they didn't have that date in there but it's why I'm saying this when it comes to the shares now if you look down through the shareholders when did they come on board so you've got these ones here that were on the original company application and that's Jordan Nelson, Dwayne Looney and we go down here to Randall Eugene McCoy. Now he was on the original document but he's no longer a shareholder so he actually got rid of his shares, his 3,000 shares and it would appear that Anik McCoy was the one who took those 3,000 shares over and that was done in document 70 blah blah and that's this one over here on the 24th of August 2017 so ultimately you can date the uh, taking on of shareholdings simply by comparing the document number that it was done under to when that document was lodged. Now when you do look at when a document has been lodged there will be three different dates that they give you because someone might lodge a document but they will ask for the record to apply to an earlier date. 
So there is always three different dates of uh, most of the time they will all match but sometimes you can actually get three different dates which um, it just indicates that on some documents like even though this document see I've got here that I've got three dates received processed and effective now if they're the same there's only one date mentioned but if the date effective was actually different I made a note of it because then it would be different to when it took over in this top part of it. So that's again another thing that um, because to actually look at those documents to find out oh well when did these people get their shares you can't date them yes you can you can know when they got their shares and when they got out simply by the movement in the documents everything has to be lodged through a document now one of the things that um, why I've been looking at Australia Pacific Life Sciences I've also been revisiting two others that I had put to the side because of well there may be an association Mark McMurtry has said that he's the director and coup of this one but he's not he's not associated with it in any way shape or form but as I've said there is from well getting to be a number of sources now that are connecting Mark McMurtry with Australia Pacific Life Sciences so I have to revisit it and find out the connection and the interesting connection being too is that this Warren Eddy McKay and Natasha Melody McKay this Whitehaven Trust down here in New Zealand um, Whitehaven Trust is something associated with Warren Eddy McKay he's got the Whitehaven what is it farm or um, oh, something or other uh, it's Warren McKay as well and it's all to do with cattle and then we look at all right so Warren McKay was born in New Zealand and you go and look at him uh, on LinkedIn and he does look like uh, he's got that ethnicity in him that he's a Maori he's got um, some connection with the tribes there and then you can see that all right well how did this all start well it all started when it was first registered in Victoria on the 3rd of May 2017 all right so who was involved when it first started we can see that Natasha McKay was the director but Warren wasn't involved not till August later on that year we can also see here that Randall McCoy had also been a director and was the secretary at the very startup. He got out nearly a year later and he also had 3,000 shares that looks like went from Randall McCoy to Annick McCoy. And the thing being here too is that there is now an international link coming into Australia and what seems to be New Zealand as well and our farms taking up our land from like I come my lineage in Tasmania is the old farmers they're still there they're still on the land generational and to think that um, they're going to you know the future could hold that the farmer that I know doesn't exist anymore it's just a commerce it's just a business like just out of Bow Desert oh, when was it probably about 10 years ago now or maybe not that long but they had just started one of those um, oh, what was it where the cows are tagged it's basically um, the cows come in they get um, milked or whatever it's an automatic dairy to actually limit 
the human contact. And see, cows are very easy to train like that. I mean, I know from, you know, as I said, generational farming, the cows actually know where the milk shed is, know when they want to go to the milk shed, and they actually line up at the gate trying to get in. You don't have to go round them up. The only thing you might need to do is if you've put them down in the bottom paddock, you might need to go down and open the gate up, which they're all waiting at to come through that gate to get back up to the cow shed. They all have, you know, this routine and they want to go to the cow shed. So it's not that hard to train them. So yes, these automatic dairies were starting to come in and also to the, the real milk where they weren't processing the milk through as many um, processes and selling it that way. And that was becoming a fairly big thing, even around the, the Bow Desert Scenic Rim area in southeast Queensland there. But anyway, back to the Atsic extract and what can be read from the information that's here. Like, what can be read here is that Randall Eugene McCoy, an American, has set up a company here in Australia associated with Natasha McKay and her husband, Warren, who also lives in Victoria with her, but he has strong ties to New Zealand where he was born and the White Haven farm. I'll just bring that up. All right, I'll just show you what uh, a web capture looks like. That's why I say that those web captures I did of all the Dun & Bradstreet pages, this is what they look like when you save them and open them up. You can't really see. A lot of them now I've gone through and I've edited them. I've chopped out all the bits that are just their promo and advertising. But as you can see, it focuses in very well. But um, yes, with all the Whitehaven ones, because there's quite a few to do with it that I did, I saved all the Whitehaven ones and they're not all associated or seemingly associated on the surface. Um, yeah, I mean, just because there's a Whitehaven company in Canada doesn't mean that it's anywhere related to one in New Zealand. There may be a connection, but that is you know, where the investigation comes in to eliminate the the ones that aren't related. So, hang on. So, this is the Dun & Bradstreet profile on of the public information available on Australia Pacific Life Sciences. And as I said, that you do actually need to verify any of the information that's on here. And because I've checked out certain things and I know that there's no income coming into some companies and yet they're showing them to have, you know, generates 1.3, well, in this case they could, but in other cases they're, they're saying that they're generating income that I know actually hasn't existed. So it actually, yes, you've got to take everything that's said with a bit of a grain of salt. Even the fact of the industry. Information technology services and professional services sector. Custom computer programming services. Well you see the thing is that before Australia Pacific Life Sciences actually pulled down their website or actually claimed that WordPress did an update and it invalidated all their other pages, there was nothing to do with that on Australia Pacific Life Sciences website. Now, unfortunately, there was, there's nothing that comes up currently on the website and there's nothing in the Wayback Machine. But somebody actually did do a screenshot when it was up. And so I can actually show you that what Australia Pacific Life Sciences is, it's not information technology services. Let me just show you what it is. And the reason that I'm exploring this is because this is something that Mark McMurtry has insisted he is a director of Australia Pacific Life Sciences. He's not. It's a lie. 
And because the name has come up several times now, there is obviously a connection with Mark McMurtry and Australia Pacific Life Sciences that hasn't been fully explored or revealed yet. So that requires a lot more digging. Now just hang on, I'll bring you up their web page. Now this is what their web page looks like. Australia Pacific Life Sciences. You can actually go there right now and see exactly this on the front page. But you click on any of these links up here and it comes up 404 not found. You might get a different error on your browser. As I explained, there's differences between the browsers. So you then have a look on the Wayback Machine. There's nothing there. And even if you look for a Australia Pacific Life Sciences dot com without the AU, which they do at some stage give a link that is just without the AU. So you follow all these things and you end up with nothing. So it's very fortunate that someone has actually taken a screenshot of this and well let's hope that they have a browser that they can now do a web capture and capture the whole page rather than having to split it across images and copy and paste and do all that. So this is their home page and if you go down, well, oh sorry, hang on, see it's an automatic thing to want to scroll down the page to see the rest of it but it's on the next image. You can see here that the name has actually changed too, that another company has been introduced, that Australia Pacific Life Sciences Management Systems Proprietary Limited. So that again is another company that I've added to the list of let's see what's going on. Now this is their contact page, Australia Pacific Life Sciences PO Box 8357 Sunnybank, Queensland. And I haven't actually done this yet, but I'm half expecting to find that P.O. box actually associated with other companies that I have either searched or will search. Much like there's the same P.O. box for so many of the companies associated with Nightcap on Minjimble, there would also be, like there's other facets that tie in with what's going on at Nightcap on Minjimble. And this Australia Pacific Life Sciences is one of them. So it's not just the tribal aspect with the OSTF and wanting to set up a, you know, this alternative lifestyle village and do all this. There's this in the mix as well. And it's been sitting in the background for months without any real information being known about it, just that it exists. And then as more and more people have come forward and mentioned some th things, Australia Pacific Life Sciences is one that keeps coming up now. Now the interesting thing is, well, all right, you think it's beef cattle, maybe even dairy, but why do they actually want the cattle? Yes, this is what Australia Pacific Life Sciences want the cattle for, the production of collagen. And uh, it's not, it's essentially to utilize every part of the cow or the cattle. Tendons, bone, cartilage found in fast growing and regenerative, regenerative, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> So I just moved it down so you could see the rest. So ultimately, they're farming the cattle for collagen and for all these types of things that farming the cattle for those would actually give. So it's not beef. It's more, well, as soon as I see collagen, I'm actually more thinking cosmetic but it is medical when it comes to so many things because the best source of immuno boosting natural things that you can actually get is to get a uh, beef extract of, from the bone. L-cartanin is the uh, amino acid that beef um, 
bones extract is the strongest immune boosting thing that you can find out there in the natural therapies. And I know this, I went into this when my mum was diagnosed terminal about ways to boost her immune system. That And it's actually kind of like using beef stock. It does taste a bit like beef stock. But it's very, very, um, yes, it's the the most strongest natural source of immuno boosting that you can actually get. And I actually wondered, you know, how they get all of that. But if you think about that, they could use the meat, the hide, and then they're looking at using all these other different types of things to cater to an industry that isn't edible. <laughs> it's more well, either pharmaceutical, medical, or cosmetic. And that's an interesting thing about when I say about checking out Dun & Bradstreet's information. Because Cannabis Industries Australia has got Dolph Cook with his industrial hemp license. He's not a medical doctor. He's got no medical qualifications whatsoever. And he certainly does not have a license to sell any kind of hemp product or cannabis product that isn't industrial. You cannot sell it for human consumption if it's industrial. And yet Dun & Bradstreet has Cannabis Industries Australia listed as having doctors. They believe it is actually like a medical practice. And that there are doctors on site. Now, the only doctor you're going to get <laughs> is doctor off the planet with his mother of Mary Jane. And if you show up unexpectedly, he's going to come out with a gun. No, that's definitely the wrong industry to have categorised them in. And that's why I say you've got to know a little bit about the information where you're getting it from that even though it's put there that is an impossibility because Dolph Cook cannot possibly have a medical license or a medical practice operating out of Cannabis Industries Australia when he's got an industrial license and what I found out about it too is that even those that do have a medical license actually have trouble um, getting rid of it once they've actually grown it, turning it into a product. So they can be, they can grow it thinking that this market for a medical um, market is there, but they can't translate it across into a product. So they've grown it all for nothing. It's not as easy as, yeah, I've got an industrial hemp license. Now I'm going to turn it into a medical hemp license. Now I'm going to be a doctor and my mother of Mary Jane, and both of us are going to bring in uh, terminally ill people and people in palliative care and give them medical advice without any medical qualifications. And, well, as I said, you've got to know a certain amount of things for yourself before you actually take steps in doing real things. I, I couldn't imagine the way they promote themselves, of my mum in palliative care when she was terminally ill, that she would end up with someone like Dolph Cook and the mother of Mary Jane because of the options. And I have to tell you that when mum was um, diagnosed terminal, she actually said to me, do you reckon you could find out if this, um, you know, this medical cannabis works and whether it can work for me. I mean, mum's been a total teetotaler her whole life. The fact that she even was considering it. And that's how come I know that anyone that even wouldn't normally consider these things, when they get diagnosed or are facing a very, well, a terminal problem, they will seek all possible solutions. So to think of someone winding up at the Cannabis Industries Australia with Dolph Cook and his mother of Mary Jane, that could be my mum. That's just really scary. 
and to even be so presumptuous to say, we're giving you medical advice without any medical training. And seriously, if you've seen any videos of Dolph, it's like he doesn't even have enough going on to really look after himself, let alone tell others how to look after themselves. It's, um, yeah, scary. But anyway, that's uh, kind of a bit off subject here. I'm just filling you in with information that you've got to check the information and you've got to start using, a, you know, a little bit of deducting, deductive reasoning that even though it's printed on a website and says they're in the medical industry, they cannot be. And Dolph Cook is definitely not a doctor. Definitely not. And he's never had any medical training. Neither has his, um, well, whether they got married or not, I don't know, but the mother of Mary Jane. They've had no medical training. At the best they might have had, is a first aid course at some stage or other, but certainly not in a position to give advice on a medical basis and to provide medical products in the cannabis field for those that are seeking medical alternatives. They have no right to be selling medical products, medical advice. But clearly this is the way they advertise themselves because that's what Dun & Bradstreet have put on their website that they are a medical business. But it is confusing because as you could see that this definitely, Australia Pacific Life Sciences, definitely isn't what Dun & Bradstreet described them as. They are quite clearly cattle. They are quite clearly wanting to farm cattle and not just for beef, but for any number of products that will fill a collagen menu. And there's just the little bottom part of the page of the products, what they would aim to provide and how they deliver it, product delivery. So ultimately there is a connection now with cattle, the medical industry, New Zealand, Victoria, uh, there's already one to Western Australia that's already been established but that's through other connections and also this one in a way but more so in others. So there's a lot of things that well we already know from their official video and what's been said that there are people from all over Australia and all over the world that are coming in to what they've got on offer. But we are assuming that what they've got on offer is only nightcap on Mingimble. But we also know that they intend to offer up a village, they just haven't got to putting in a DA for it yet. So all of these things that they're not, you know, putting out there as something right now doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going on and especially as I said since it's come up in from several different sources now that don't actually even know each other that well as far as I know that they know this Australia Pacific Life Sciences is involved and Mark McMurtry is involved with that so yes it's becoming more and more interesting now because uh, at the early days of Bulla Bulla, there were, they tried farming cattle on there. That didn't work out well. They ended up calling in the police because cattle went missing, uh, calves died, there was arguments over what happened with it. And apparently, um, when they did end up selling them off, they were short about 20 head that they never got paid for. That According to the books, I think there was so many head that were sold when there was actually, you know, like 20 more or something. So right from the word go at Bulla Bulla, there has been something associated with the cattle. And, uh, you know, it's just been known. 
But how it still relates or translates to today, nobody had really well put anything together as far as how does it relate. And it is all Mark McMurtry with his LinkedIn uh, statement that he is director and coup of Australia Pacific Life Sciences when he's not on paper anywhere to do with them. But then that's not unusual that he might be acting in some kind of consulting capacity. He's employed by them, but, you know, he likes to think he's important, so he's going to put himself down as a director and slash coup rather than sales rep or part-time consultant or whatever he wants. You know, it's not a very important job. You don't sound important if you've just got a job title. You have to be involved in the company. You've got to be like he is the convener of the OSTF. You know, he's got to have all these important titles to make himself feel important. And that's what people that have low self-esteem and really don't like themselves, that's what they try and do to build up their own self-importance by creating this illusion around this story. And then they start to believe it and then they accuse other people of lying when they say, well, you're just full of shit, mate. <laughs> now, this page is the interesting page. This is the partner's page. So you can see how it relates on the world scale, what Mark McMurtry is involved with. And it's showing down here in Victoria, not up here in Queensland, or Queensland, New South Wales border, but Northern Rivers, New South Wales, where they would be grazing those cattle or growing those cattle to these available markets. So here we've got the Australian connection, the New Zealand connection, and over here in America, to Pure Med Pharma, McCoy, Indust uh, McCoy Enterprises, and Bovine Collagen pro Products. So here, these pages now, as I said, because of what they said on the first page, that there was a WordPress update and these pages disappeared, I actually think that that is just an excuse. I think they pulled them down because this is something that they don't want people to know. Once things had got to a certain stage, they wanted to eliminate any online ability to connect certain activities to each other. But already now, through Australian Australia Pacific Life Sciences and Mark McMurtry's insistence on being director slash coup of this company, and the fact that it has come up, yes, it's been mentioned by at least three different people now. And it's becoming something of, well, this needs to be looked at seriously. He might not be down on paper at ATSIC, but he is certainly involved with them. And it is also something that fits in with what could be done at Nightcap on Minjimbal. And it also fits in with something that pr could probably also be done on the property that, well, they'll be settling on that soon if they come up with the money in Waratah Court. They could actually also grow cattle there too to provide to these markets. So it's not just cattle and beef and international markets but it's also now crossing over into the medical and the big pharma industry. And now that's the American tie-in with the New Zealand. Now, this has got a bit long, and I won't go too much into it in this video, but uh, I'll just briefly show you. So this is capital Z, and when Capital Z first came up, it was listed as being a creditor for Wollumbin Horizons Proprietary Limited in the liquidation. And as the story goes, it is Derek Zillman. He was uh, 
the he was owed money he lent the money he didn't get it um well he couldn't get it back it was translated into shares or something like that which ultimately that's a different story but um what goes on here when you're checking out certain companies you do end up doing extracts that seemingly have nothing to do with them but at the time when i did the the extracts and capital z proprietary limited because it was only listed on the liquidators list as capital z and derek zillman is actually capital z holdings so of course you're going to look up capital z but then you find all these names that well that's not Derek Zillman <laughs> and it's in Scribbly Gum Street in Sunnybank Hills and there is actually an association with Sunnybank because that Australia Pacific Life Sciences has got the PO box in Sunnybank so I mean yes it's a big area and there is a strong predominance of the Asian community in Sunnybank so um, now the reason I'm actually bringing this up has got to do with this on the other side he here which is actually a personal name extract. So searching all Derek or De Real John Zillman and all his associations past and present shareholdings, directorships and secretaryships. And so ultimately there have been companies that have been identified that he's a director in and that comes up with the Eastern Consortium and the Eastern Consortium Consulting and then there's also other companies like um, Sapient Infrastructure and I think it's Sapient Consulting off memory the other one but he's all tied up with these things so being that Derek Zillman is sort of like captain of their ship you look at what his tie-ins are because the question has always been said why does such a seemingly intelligent man with with business savvy you know why is he hooked up with such a seemingly dead end and I do see the development the DA as a dead end I don't see how they can build what they want to it's just not within the realms of realistic thinking even if they might have, which they would, I guarantee you, a lawyer that could walk in and go, oh, but we can do this because of this, because they've found every one of those clauses before they actually submitted to the council with all those problems in there. They found a way to explain them away before they actually did it. So, well, that's what I would anticipate they've done anyway. So I know that... And if you go on to Dun & Bradstreet's site and you look, it brings up the people that are key associated with these Sapient and um, Eastern Consortium. And Derek Zillman isn't mentioned at all. It is actually um, more, as you would expect, Eastern being Asian, Asian names. That's that what you're looking at here. So you know that from the search on him that he actually is a director in these companies yet he's keeping it very hush hush he's not on any public information anywhere other than on the ATSIC extract even Dun & Bradstreet when they're putting up the key principles they're putting in other directors but not Derek Zillman so Derek Zillman is not showing up as being associated with a lot of these companies on um, Dun & Bradstreet's website and yet I know he is simply because I've I've got the extract the the ATSIC extracts and the uh, personal name history of all possible combinations that he could be involved with whether it's Derek Zillman Derek John Zillman or Daryl John Zillman whether he's used one date of birth and in, in other people's circumstances their different dates of birth have been checked out their variations on the spellings of their names so this is what you really need to go into if you want to establish all the company links and all the people that can be traced so far I've only done what you'd call 
a well a first level search the next level search really at ATSIC would be to actually get copies of all the documents that were lodged where these changes were made because there could be and especially if there's been an alteration document that changes what came before it like in Michaela Lowe's case where you've got ATSIC extracts that were done before the correction was done that makes that you can see that she's on the records then you do an historical search and she's disappeared from the historical search because that correction document wiped her out of both the historical and the current it was correcting a mistake so you need to also first look too at every correction document that they may submit now NCV Enterprises submitted a correction document and that one needs to be looked at because in submitting that they actually created a share issue discrepancy. There are two more shares that have been issued than what they say that exist. So there is a share discrepancy issue and that as part of all things will be in, reported to ATSIC that there is that share discrepancy. Now how that occurred you need to go in and look at the document that they lodged to actually make that change happen to see how it went from being yeah it balances to okay they lodged this they then did these things in correction and now in that correction they've actually made it wrong that's one of the things that I haven't got to yet but most definitely you do need to search any documents that contain uh, an alteration to any document that's previously been issued because it can make something completely disappear from the records and that actual document is the only place that you're going to find out that that person ever had anything to do with it. So there could have been someone, a director, for six months. They put in a correction, it's accepted by ATSIC, and they disappeared as if they were never there in the first place. So you need to be careful of the corrections that they make. Now one thing I did find when I did a personal name search on these people is that because they actually can give the same date of birth but all a completely different place of birth you can tie in well yeah they're the same people and you can clearly see that in certain circumstances um, they've given a completely different country of birth rather than just a town and it's it's something that when I've checked out all the directors and shareholders of the companies that are associated with Derek Zillman and Mark Murtry. Like I'm saying those two because they're the ones that have had the um, discrepancies, I suppose you could say the flags raised because the information they claim, well in Mark McMurtry's case, what he claims doesn't match the ATSIC records. So why doesn't it? Is he just big noting himself or is there some real connection? Now, I had dismissed it pretty much as just him big noting himself. But when it gets brought up by, you know, as I said, so many people now, uh, there's got to be some tangible connection there that needs to be investigated. So in doing that, I'm also investigating whether there is any link with the Asian Consortium and the capital Z that was only set up mid last year. I mean the way I look at it is that it's highly possible that shareholders of the Eastern Consortium company started up their own company and are dealing with their own branch and they why they called it capital Z one you just don't know why people call some names companies 
But someone did actually point out, someone very clever, that capital Z is actually also another way of pointing out that you are a Zionist. <laughs> yeah, it's, and if you don't know what a Zionist is, uh, you need to go look it up because I'm not going down that rabbit hole. But uh, there are those rabbit holes that are associated with them. Even Mark Darwin brings it up in uh, the videos about Zionists and Zionism. And, uh, yeah, well, as I said, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> so a lot of things I've already checked out and I have my opinion on them and, you know, whether there's any validity or not to something. And ultimately, at the end of it, you've got to decide, well, yeah, knowing that, what, what good is it to me to know? What difference can I make in knowing that? And uh, a lot of people get caught up in these conspiracy theories because they think that getting caught up in them and focusing on them will actually eventuate change. But it actually doesn't. It just eventuates mental imbalance <laughs> and uh, a lot of psychological problems, paranoia. Um, yes, there's a lot of them that I could mention that are exceptionally paranoid associated with Nightcap on Mingimble. So, but anyway, it's got, oh, look at that. It's over now. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I did want to try bring a little bit of an understanding about how, what's going on at Nightcap on Mingimble. When you look at the companies, when you look at the people involved and what they're involved in and how it may actually tie back to Nightcap on Mingible. Uh, some of the connections can't be made until you have others that can actually bring up something about it that you don't know. And in this instance, uh, with Australia Pacific Life Sciences, I've had it brought up now on several occasions that I have to look at it seriously. And I'm, that's why I'm bringing it to you to tell you that there is somehow some connection at NICAP on Mingimble with Australia Pacific Life Sciences, cattle, cattle farming, um, yeah, and well, what Australia Pacific Life Sciences actually wanted for collagen farming. And it also may explain their desire to actually purchase surrounding properties. Because, you know, I know what it's like because I've got relatives that are in different parts of Tasmania. And at different times when they need to move the cattle between one paddock or another, they have to end up going out on the road. So to transfer cattle that might be grazing on 3222, just... Um, across the road and up into Waratah Court to graze up over there is actually quite, um, well, for me, it's actually foreseeable. I can see them. And even if you go down the Lions Road, the link between the New South Wales and Queensland, you know, across that border crossing, you can get stopped at times with the farmer moving his cattle and that's I've done that several times actually just stopped and waited because he's moving his cattle and they're not going to move any faster than what they're going because they know where they're going and yeah they'll just plod along so yeah that is actually a foreseeable thing that they could utilize the land at Nightcap on Mingimble that is more down in the valleys which is also another reason why they haven't actually um, put any real housing down in any cleared areas. Why they've also allocated that exclusive lot areas would be open area, open space. It's like you can't know that those people are going to chop down all the trees that are there now. Well, you could if you actually plan to chop down those trees because they weren't covered by a forestry lease and you could sell them off and make money out of it that way, as well as once you've cleared it, you can then graze your cattle or grow your cattle there. And that would also explain why they wanted 
so much open space. You know, you're only supposed to clear an acre, not the whole lot. And yet there is large parts of it where they're showing that the whole lot would be open space, even in exclusive use areas that have got trees on them now. And these ones, I believe, would not be under forestry. I'm looking at natural growth that they would be removing, not what the forestry put in and has a lease on. So they, from what I looked at, even when I was looking at the DA, it did look like because they couldn't get the forestry timber, there was still plenty of timber that they could access, chop down and sell. And it would create all these open spaces that people would then live on and graze cattle on. And there's also the thing too that even going back to Bulla Bulla, the back of 3222 has always been um, like a plan for the government. It's a tentative plan, not a yes, we're going to do it, but it's sort of like on hold because we might do it, is that they want to stick a dam in there. They may turn, the government may turn the back of 3222 and back down through other areas into a dam through Peter Van Leishout's land. So they would not allow people to build houses where there may be a dam because they've been going through that in Queensland where they've been wanting to build a dam and move people off the land. That's pretty hard to do, especially when it's generational. It's like, yeah, it's, it's not right. But anyway, that's not the issue. The issue being that having a dam there would also provide a ready source for cattle to um, just walk up and feed. You don't have to provide feed trough, well, the water troughs everywhere because animals will naturally migrate to the water holes the way they know they are. And you could also see that the area that they cleared out the front of 3222 around Christmas time where they went in and they bulldozed it all over, uh, they could quite easily be wanting to turn that into grass for grazing. So a lot of these things to do with cattle and raising cattle for whether it's beef or whatever, I mean, there are other people in the area that are doing exactly the same thing. And it's a perfectly legitimate and valid business. And But that's why everything that I bring up associated with them, it's like some people will say, well, what's wrong with that? It's like, there's nothing wrong with that. So why is it a secret? It's because of what they appear to want to achieve on the outside at NICAP on Minjimbal doesn't always match up with what everything and what is coming together, especially with the cattle, and what it looks like they're running as a sideline project that they're not actually telling anyone about. Do the current investors in Nightcap on Minjimbal know anything about planned cattle and cattle farming for collagen? And the thing being is that a lot of people that they will be getting there wouldn't want to do the dairy, I mean the, the cattle, because they know eventually they're going to go off to the slaughterhouse. It's the most heartbreaking thing to look at a little calf and know that, you know, enjoy it while you can because you're destined for a, someone's dinner plate. And, yeah, you can't get too attached. And as I said, it's really hard because when I was a kid and I used to go to the farms, You'd um, go in and there'd be one occasional calf that the mother wouldn't feed it for some reason. So you'd have to feed them and then they get to a certain stage too where they're trying to wean them off their mother. And you get some that won't take to the feeding trough that they're all given and you've got to hand feed them. And they're just so adorable. So yes, it's, it's not something that the mindset of the people that they're saying they want to attract into the area that, you know, you're feeding a baby through a bottle, you getting attached. You don't want to send them off to the slaughterhouse. So it's not really something that I believe that they would be promoting that, yeah, we're going to raise a lot of animals to get killed. We're not going to kill them on the property. They'll go off to get killed. 
But yeah, while they're here, they can have a happy life. That's just like watching the condemned, you know. That that's what I felt like every time the car the calves were born, and you know, if you were unlucky enough to be <laughs> a steer, well, yeah, we know where you're ending up. If you're a cow, well, you're going to live probably a long and comfortable life. You're going to be well looked after, but. Yeah, if you're a boy, yep. And it's just that simple for a cow or cattle to be born the wrong gender. It means the difference between living out your life to the fullest or barely making your teenage years and getting put on a dinner plate or harvested for what other products that you can provide to people. Yes, I don't think that would be a concept that goes down very well with those seeking the alternative lifestyle, especially since many of them are actually vegan or vegetarian. It's just not going to go down well. So maybe that's why it's a secret, because if the full plans were known, people wouldn't want to invest in essentially what is one step before a slaughterhouse. Anyway... They just, you know, some do have a wonderful life before they end up on a dinner plate. And that's all you can do for a lot of them is when you go past a paddock and see the little calf and he comes over and he, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you can give them that joy and appreciate that moment. Don't think about where that future is going to be for that poor animal. Anyway, enough said. It's got really long. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And I didn't even get on to Creative Vision Enterprises, which is Mark Darwin, apparently. Well, it's supposed to be Mark Darwin because it's retro renovation caravans or whatever. But it's actually not Mark Darwin. It's Jessica Driver, I think it is, from memory. As I said, I haven't got on to bring that up. I go through these things as I bring them up. And again, I am going to have to see, all right, so it's not Mark Darwin, but he's clearly using the same trading names. All right, and he's not using Caroline Coman. Who is this Jessica Driver to him? Does he know Jessica Driver? Is she perhaps in business with him in some other way? Which would be hard to know because there is only one current listing for Mark Darwin in his name, and that's as a shareholder for a company. All the other listings he would hold, well, Caroline Coman held shares in Loved Ones Tribe. When he got, when he changed his shares in Cannabis Industries Australia from Mark Darwin to Loved Ones Tribe, it was just a way to separate himself uh, on paperwork. And that's what Adrian Brennock does too when he puts everything into Christy Brennock's name as he's going bankrupt, knowing that he doesn't want to lose control of Nyepi, so he goes on and he transfers it all into his wife's name. That's actually very illegal, Adrian Brennock, and that's a, that means that you had to swear a false statement in your discovery during bankruptcy when, all right, what are your assets and what are your liabilities? You would have made a false statement discovery statement and uh, that again is another crime it's not looking good for Adrian Brennock I mean Adrian Brennock has got a lot to answer for a lot the only reason that it's taken so t much time to get to this point and getting everything ready to pretty much take it forward is the complexities of the dealings between people and even with you know so much research that's been done even now I'm still doing new research on do these people have any connection with Derek Zillman Eastern Consortium and that aspect of what Derek Zillman's tied into because if he does then that could also explain where the questions come up is where do they get the money from there have not been enough investors invest money into NICAP or Minjimble 
to support all their activities over the years. It just simply hasn't been. Uh, it's cost them more money just in lawyers alone, I'm sure. I've got several years worth of records for um, several different places. One year, or one period, uh, from I think June 2016 to September 2018, there's nearly half a million in lawyers' fees between well five or six different lawyers' companies because as they do, they pick a lawyer for every particular need. They find a specialty lawyer. So they don't just have one, they've got a handful. And every time they talk in the boxes where I'm going to talk to Roth Wall, that costs them $350 to talk to Roth Wall. If they talk to his secretary, that was a lot cheaper. It was only 150 I think. But you see, all this information actually comes from the court book and what was submitted in court to do with Wollumbin Horizons and other cases. So all of this stuff can eventually be found out and know certain things. There's also some things that you've just got to dig a little bit deeper because it, it has been rumoured, and I even did a video on it, the Asian Consortium Connection. Well, there is the Eastern Consortium uh, and the Eastern Consortium Consulting. And if you look on Dun & Bradstreet, one's a parent company, the other one's a subsidiary. And Derek Zillman is a director on both of those and on both of those, he's not even mentioned as a director. And it's same, it's the same for the sapient ones that the ones that do show up, he's not connected with it on their records either, even though I know he's a director, because I've got the information directly from where these changes are made. Anyway, that's really long. <laughs> Sorry for yakking on. But I did actually just cover all of them briefly now that I wanted to. Even the creative vision, which, hang on. There we go. Because I think I've said in previous videos that, um, well, if they're still up anyway, I'll, I'll just repeat it anyway. That Retro Caravan Renovations is the business that Mark Darwin's running. On the Kaz Darwin channel, he was advertising it and also had links to a Facebook page and that Facebook page had all these contacts and a website as well. So he was Retro Caravan Renovations. That's why I had him down as Darwin, Mark Darwin. But you look it up and the directorship and everything is Jessica Driver. So here's Mark Darwin trading as someone else's business name with a website and Facebook and everything like that. Now, again, is it something that he's associated with, much like Mark McMurtry is associated with Australian Pacific Life Sciences, but just not on the paper level? Because there is a direct avoidance for people to actually want to be on paper. Mark Darwin, Adrian Brennock, Mark McMurtry, I'm even surprised that Mark McMurtry put his name down on um, Yudaki, but he needed to get in on that because that's going to be the new mother holder, isn't it? <laughs> Where everyone's going to be funneled into that and it's going to be worth a shit ton. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and one correction I have to make too is that in a previous video where I was exploring, and I know that one's been um, blocked, I was exploring uh, data births and people. The Mark James McMurtry, that is, I said, seemingly different, appears to be a dentist, not sure of. Well, I'm a little bit more convinced now that it is just another version of the Mark McMurtry we know. Again, information's coming from several different sources that, and as best where you can get independent sources so that they can virtually verify each other because they do not know each other, have not been in the same circumstances to actually hear of that information. Or, you see, there are 
circles that everybody moves in and people move in and out of those circles and some people sit quietly in circles and never get noticed they learn a lot they move on but they know a lot and it's those people that have been coming out I suppose in in a lot of different areas like around the Bulla Bulla set up and what what has come about with them is that how many investors or potential investors with their camp outs did they have come in that were still actually talking to those that were investors they may not have decided to go through with the investment because maybe they couldn't afford it or for one reason or another but they stayed in contact with some of the friends that they'd made in the development or in Bulla Bulla and it's also come up in the Voxes too how that situation has arisen that we don't want these people being sent this information because they're not part of Bulla Bulla so yeah don't include them but that doesn't stop people that are friends with those still of just sending them on a copy and saying here look you know they won't send you a copy but read the latest what's going on you know and why wouldn't they want to share what's going on in the community they are trying to build they're excited about it they want to share that information and it's all this big secret you can't tell people it's like no because the more people that know certain information the more there is that may actually pick up that what was the promise and what was delivered don't match and the more paperwork that is created in those discrepancies the easier it is to show these things so yes that's it for um it this time i will finish off just uh, mentioned all the companies and how mark darwin mark mcmurtry and Derek Zillman and the companies that well some they are known to be associated with and some they are definitely associated with because it's on paper at Atsic and others where clearly Australia Pacific Life Sciences is not what they claim to be it is definitely about farming cattle for their products which yeah goes down well in an alternative community where you're going to have a lot of vegans and vegetarians I mean I'm not either and I know that I can't watch them being sent off in a truck I can't even think about that because you just look into their faces and it's like oh you poor things and when I lived fairly close to an abattoir that well close enough that in the still of night that you could hear them squealing because as they start the the lineup of they've just got a fresh batch of animals in it's calm to begin with but then they sense it and they start squealing and it's horrible it really is a horrible thing you know that those animals know that they are going to that something very fearful is coming for them and they do let out a lot of yells for help it's really heartbreaking so anyway <laughs> I was gonna say I'll leave it on that positive note but <laughs> that's a really negative note to leave it on isn't it I'll tell you what the positive thing is that um, I'm about to release uh, the rest of all the parts of the boxes I've just received uh, nearly as many number of boxes they will not be released only this first batch is actually going to be released the rest is going to be kept and added to all the other evidence that I have been unable to share because it really just yeah it does actually let them know that I know too much and it's better that they don't know that I know that those things right now <laughs> because I'm already given them enough that they know what to prepare for it's what they don't know to prepare for prepare for that is of the most benefit to me and that's why sadly 
I do not share certain information with you. I will bring out certain information that I've learned and I can help you direct and look at these this information yourself. I mean, you may even be able to come up with some ideas on how these things connect that I don't. And, well, let's just say that me putting out previous videos where I don't know that much about what's going on, people that do know more about what's going on, well, sooner or later it seems that someone actually finds me and fills me in a bit on it. So it's a good thing. <laughs> Multiple people. Anyway, yuck, yuck, yuck. Couldn't leave it on a bad note. Have a good day anyway. And I'll catch you next time. Bye.